welcome back. How, how lucky we are. I hope you enjoyed lunch, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and I welcome you back. I, I've had a lot of conversations with you folks over the last couple of days, and one of the comments that's come up over and over again is, how do I make a difference? And I just think about what my father told me, which is, uh, you know, son, you are making a difference. It may not seem like it, but you really are making a difference. And I want you to think about it the same way when you uh, make the journey forward, is you are making a difference, a crucial difference, each and every one of you, and what's going to happen in the future. There are some things standing in our way as far as making progress, and uh, that's what I want to discuss with you over the next hour. Uh, it's uh, likely I, I would be much more popular if I wasn't critical. Uh, I've never been a... Uh, a politically correct person. I'm not here to win a popularity contest. I'm here to win. And that's uh, what my plan is. And so if you take offense to anything I say, okay, <laughs> it's fine. Uh, if you misunderstand anything I say, that's a problem. Now I want to talk to you about, uh, about uh, some of the hindrances in terms of getting the correct diet uh, across. Uh, there are a lot of people out there that uh, don't tell the truth. I'll just be plain and simple. I had a nice conversation with Dr. Colin last evening, and he told me the same thing my father told me, is to tell the truth. Uh, I don't know what the motivations of many of these people are. Let's just assume they're, they're being honest and uh, they'll have to face their maker someday and deal with what they've said and what, what they've caused in the world. Uh, the next hour presentation is about uh, the worst and the best. 1972, Robert Atkins published the uh, Atkins Diet. This is a diet based on bacon, brie, and butter. It's the ultimate in the low-carb diet. 1972. Since then, since then, many of us have learned that these kinds of foods are bad for our health, creating heart disease, diabetes, constipation, kidney stones, etc. We've learned those things uh, and nobody would buy into that kind of concept these days, would they? And plus we've learned about environmental impact of these kinds of foods. Now how in the world do you sell somebody a similar low carb diet like the Atkins diet? You must take a backdoor approach because nobody would buy a book called Eat More Animals to Lose Weight would they? So the new approaches to the low carb, in other words, virtually no plant food approach, the new books are called Wheat Belly. In other words, eating weight causes a big belly, and Grain Brain, in other words, grains damage your brain. It's a backdoor approach to trying to sell you the same low carb, environmentally unfriendly, destructive, planetary destructive, animal destructive diets, and how do they fool otherwise intelligent people who know that our future really depends upon getting the truth across, even if it were true that eating all these animal foods result in weight loss, and they do, because they make you sick. Even if it were true, you as people of uh, consciousness and knowledge, you know that this is the wrong thing to do. So to pull off this monumental task of deceiving otherwise intelligent people, they must ignore the bulk of the science, exaggerate the truth, and make false associations. Everybody with me? Okay, so I'm going to tell you about how this works. Let's first explain what high carbohydrate, low fat diets are. Uh, these are diets with lots of sugar. Sugar is made by plants. Only plants make sugar. The kind of sugar I'm talking about is formed in natural sugars like starches, vegetables, and fruits. It's not refined sugar like they put in Coca-Cola. Okay, you have to be clear about this. It's adequate in protein, starches, vegetables, and fruits are, uh, loaded with vitamins and minerals, has plenty of fat to nourish your brain, even children's brains. That's the kind of diet I recommend is high carbohydrate, starch-based, 
meal plan. A low carbohydrate diet has almost no plant foods in it. That was the original Atkins diet. You had to eat so little sugar that you went into ketosis, which is a state that simulates sickness, and that's the way it works. You initially lose uh, your carbohydrate stores, your glycogen storage, which are about two pounds, and visibly stored in your muscles and liver as glycogen. And with each two pounds, with each uh, molecule of glycogen goes two molecules of water. For each two pounds of glycogen, you store four pounds of water. So initially, you start these sugar deficient diets, carbohydrate deficient diets, and you're impressed because you just lost six, eight pounds of water. And then you go into ketosis, you lose your appetite, you're sick, you continue to lose weight for a while. Now, because people who recommended these kinds of diets, these very low carbohydrate diets, they've been going back for more than 100 years. Because the science was so overwhelming that these diets were deficient, dietary fiber is only present in plants. Vitamin C is only present in plants. Phytochemicals, phytochemicals only present in plants. They have come back with an apology. It is an apology. What they've added is they've added non-starchy red, green, and yellow vegetables like some kale, broccoli, Brussels sprouts to apologize for these dangerous diets. So don't get confused. It's not that these people don't recommend some vegetables, but their goal is to get you to the bliss of ketosis. All right, let's talk about how you have to ignore the bulk of the scientific literature. The bo to ignore the bulk of the scientific literature, you have to address what you and I care about, what dietitians care about, what doctors care about, or what uh, hospitals should care about, and insurance companies should care about. Not about whether or not you lose some weight, but whether or not you get healthy and avoid disease and live long. Isn't that the important thing? There have been three major studies that have addressed the effects of low carbohydrate diets on disease and mortality. They are published in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 2010. The animal low carbohydrate score was associated with a higher all cause mortality. The second study in the British Medical Journal, low carbohydrate high protein diets used on a regular basis are associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Low carbohydrate diets were associated with significant higher risk of all cause mortality as published in the Open Access Journal PLOS1. Excuse me, there are no studies that say the opposite, no studies that uh, incriminate high carbohydrate plant based diets. That's what you care about. You have to exaggerate the truth to get intelligent people to buy into these kinds of diets. And this is the study that they use. It links carbohydrates, sugar, right? Sugar made by plants, stored in the form of starches, vegetables, and fruits. They link it to inflammation. And you've all heard that disease is caused by inflammation, and we're going to talk about that. This is a convoluted theoretical concept that's largely based on a condition called celiac disease. You can read the paper. It's their only stand. Celiac disease, it's an unusual condition. It affects fewer than one in 100 people. It's an important disease. Don't let me minimize the importance of celiac disease, particularly those, for those people who have celiac disease. What happens in these sensitive people when they eat the gluten moiety that's found in high concentrations of wheat, barley, and rye, the intestinal villi get damaged the intestinal villi have a one cell layer that uh, protects you, the inside of the body, from the food in the gut. And when that gets damaged, you develop a leaky gut, and that can be followed by all kinds of things, increased risk of cancer, autoimmune diseases, etc. This is why you hear so much about gluten. And remember, 34 to 40% of the consumers are out there trying to buy gluten free foods, gluten free cakes and cookies to solve their health problems. Now this hurts people with real celiac disease. This is a serious condition. Say you're somebody with celiac disease and you really need to avoid wheat, barley, and rye. And you go into the restaurant and you tell the waiter, I have uh, a serious condition, uh, I have to be gluten-free, 
I don't want wheat, barley, and rye. And your soup comes out with some croutons. And you start to eat it and you get very sick. Well, the waiter says, look, the last 30 people who came in here who said they couldn't have gluten, I didn't see them get into trouble. You see, it's a disservice to people with celiac disease, too, to falsify this information. Fewer than 1% of the population has this important condition. But you can't use celiac disease to demonize all carbohydrates for all people. Even if you have celiac disease, look at the grains that you can eat. Rice, corn, how about the other starches? Potatoes, sweet potatoes. But see, these authors, they generalize it to all carbohydrates, to all people. But consider the importance of even wheat, barley, and rye, the foods high in gluten, to the world. I mean, consider the global historical perspective. Wheat, barley, and rye fueled the development of civilizations. The Middle East, the Middle East used to be known as the bread basket of the world. The staff of life is bread. Still today, grains, including wheat, barley, and rye, serve as the major source of protein, fats, vitamins, and minerals around the world. Let's have a little fun. Wheat belly and grain brain have solved the obesity crisis in America. Really? And by eating the foods that actually made everyone fat. It's a miracle! Do you understand? <laughs> Thank you, my good friend Jeff Nelson, for producing this. Yes. You can see the truth, ladies and gentlemen. You can see the truth. But uh, these folks, they exaggerate the truth. The scientific studies on grains, whole grains, wheat, etc., show that grains. If you review all the studies, have a 26% reduction in the risk of type 2 diabetes and a 21% reduction in the risk of heart disease. That's what the science says. Low carbohydrate diet advocates confuse people with the claim that it's inflammation that's the cause of disease. Inflammation is the cause of disease. They confuse even scientists and TV hosts. Uh, People get confused. Inflammation causes disease. Inflammation is the result of injury. Let me explain to you how this happens uh, so you can easily understand it. You have healthy lungs. You smoke cigarettes. The cigarette particles injure the lungs. 
the lungs become inflamed. If you continue to repeat that injury 20 times a day, eventually that inflammation results in the laying down of scar tissue and then you get emphysema. Do you understand where inflammation comes from? If you injure yourself, the natural, normally healing response of the body is to swell, become red, develop pain, it's inflammation. It's the result of repeated injury. The source of repeated injury for the diseases that uh, we suffer from is an uncontrolled fork and spoon. The very foods advocated by low carbohydrate diet gurus. If you want to stop the inflammation, you stop the injury and the natural response of the body is to heal and you reverse disease. It is no more complicated than that. If I keep throwing acid on my skin, I will keep developing sores on my skin. The uh, healing goes on and on and on, but I just keep throwing acid on it over and over again, and my healing process can, processes cannot keep up with the injury. Now, how do I get that hand to heal? I stop the repeated injury. Do you understand? It's the same thing with the rest of your body, the arthritis, the inflammation of the arteries, and so on. If you want to heal, healing's always going on. Your body has never let you down. You just must restop the repeated injury as uh, uh, one of our next advanced study speakers will tell you about, Dr. Dean Ornish. And his uh, classic research where he took people with severe coronary artery disease, stopped the repeated injury, and guess what? They healed. Atherosclerosis is reversed. Your body never, ever stops healing. Low-carbohydrate uh, diet advocates claim grains, and especially wheat, are the source of inflammation. One of the ways you measure inflammation is with a nonspecific blood test called a C-reactive protein, and it's, if it's highly sensitive HS, then it means it's, it's very good at detecting inflammation. Inflammation, there are some signs of inflammation, like if you... Uh, get an infected lung. Uh, your body becomes inflamed, tries to heal. One of the signs you develop is a fever. We also develop a fever if you uh, get an infected foot or get malaria. I mean, the body only has a few ways to respond to injury. And one of those signs of response to injury, a sign of inflammation is C-reactive protein. And we measure that in the blood as highly, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. So let's look at what the research says. Whole grains are associated with a serum concentration of high sensitivity C-reactive protein among postmenopausal women. Women who consumed one serving per day of whole grains had a lower probability of having moderate or elevated C-reactive protein according to the AHA, American Heart Association, criteria compared with non-consumers. So wheat products, lower inflammation. Ah, uh, let's see. After adjusting for other dietary factors, each serving of whole wheat grains is estimated to reduce C-reactive protein concentrations by approximately 7%. Diets high in whole grains are associated with 20 to 30% reduction in the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Biomarkers of systemic inflammation tend to be reduced in people consuming high intakes of whole grains. There is no contradictory evidence. Scientific truth is meat, eggs, and dairy foods are the source of inflammation, raising C-reactive protein. In this study, European Journal of Nutrition, 2013, high consumption of whole grain breads is related to lower levels of C-reactive protein, whereas high consumption of red meat is associated with higher levels of inflammation. Biomarkers of inflammation were almost all meat-based in Western patterns. That's what the review articles say. And just uh, last, just this month, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, greater red meat intake is associated with unfavorable plasma concentrations of inflammatory and glucose metabolic biomarkers in diabetes-free women. There is no contrary information. 
Scientific truth is meat, dairy, and eggs are the sources of inflammation. Now, there are various explanations as to how this injury occurs. It doesn't matter. We know the source of the problem. There's the cholesterol hypothesis, which we've talked about, how cholesterol or oxidized cholesterol injures the arteries. If you want a complete review of uh, 90 years of research, Stuart Trussell will provide it for you in this very comprehensive book. We've talked about the TMAO hypothesis, trimethylamine oxide, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, how when you eat carnitine, carna, you get it, meat, or choline, which is present in animal foods, that goes, uh, when these foods, these precursors from meat, dairy, and eggs go into the gut, the gut bacteria can convert these precursors into trimethylamine, which is converted in your liver, liver to trimethylamine oxide, which damages your arteries. Another thing you ought to think about is uh, this particular paper, which is uh, human beings were not designed to consume cow's milk. And cow's milk, just think about it. It's the wrong food and easily is a major source of the disease that people suffer from. What do you care what the mechanism is? There is no debate, ladies and gentlemen. There is absolutely no debate about this. A guy named Snow, the father of uh, epidemiology, <clears throat> he uh, did some research in London a few centuries ago. What they were finding is that people were getting sick in London, but he noticed some differences. He noticed uh, that uh, there were a few places in this area of London where they didn't get this uh, terrible, deadly disease. Uh, what he noticed was in a beer factory where they got their water from uh, a special source, the people at that population didn't get this horrible disease. And then what they discovered, epidemiology, by looking at the, the area where the disease occurs, they discovered a well. And uh, what he did, he didn't know what was in the well. He didn't know about cholera. They didn't discover cholera for another 100 years. He just took the the pump handle off the well and cured, cured cholera in London, father of epidemiology. All you have to do is take the pump handle off the well. You don't have to know the mechanisms. We know where the problem is. So you have to make false associations to sell intelligent people these low carb diets. They claim carbohydrates, sugar, remember sugar, starches, vegetables, and fruits. Carbohydrates are the cause of diabetes. Well, diabetes, you know, they have high blood sugar. So you assume it has to be true. And after you eat starches, vegetables, and fruits, your blood sugar goes up. Well, it's supposed to go up. That's why you eat. And if you happen to be a, an endurance runner, you eat foods that are very high in carbohydrates called carbohydrate loading. And you even eat foods that have a high glycemic index so you can get more energy to replace that glycogen so you can win the race. The blood sugar is supposed to go up. That's normal physiologic function from eating. And your lowest glycemic index foods are your animal foods. Yeah. Worldwide, just look at the picture. Look at the countries where obesity is common. Type 2 diabetes and obesity are virtually equal. Look at diabetes worldwide. You know, in China, uh, back before 1980, fewer than 1% of the population was diabetic. Today, China has the highest incidence of diabetes in the world, 12% of the population. What happened? Their genes change? They catch a virus? Meat consumption. Dairy consumption. People eat these foods, they're rich foods, they get fat and sick like kings and queens of old. Now, I, I, I hope you've heard this message from me clearly. I want to state it again so that you can take action. And that message is somebody can't walk up to you and say, you can't eat meat, you can't eat dairy, because you say, well, I will starve to death. There's nothing to eat. It's like not breathing air or drinking water. It's impossible to do. <coughs> you, you can't give that message to people. They don't get it, and they can't get it. Instead, what you may ex must explain to them is that the human being is a starchivore, a starchitarian, a starch eater. We always have been, we always will be. 
no matter how far you look back in history, and we've gone a long ways back in history today, the Mayans and the Aztecs, the people of the corn, the Asians, rice eaters. It's always been that way, it always will be that way. Human beings are starch eaters. When we give up that common source of calories, starch, we become rich. We get, uh, we get looking like kings and queens and Americans. That's what happens. Now, I, I know some of you think I'm rather draconian, I'm rather severe because of the kind of recommendations I give you. That's because you can't do otherwise than for me to define for you what to do in black and white. It's just like if you've ever been a cigarette smoker. I've never met a cigarette smoker who cut down and quit. I've never met, I've been in medicine 40 years. I've never met an alcoholic that sobered up by switching to beer. I've never seen it happen. <clears throat> you must have black and white uh, decisions that you can make. If I tell you that white is starches, vegetables, and fruit, and black, in other words, rich foods, whatever you want to call them, however you want to categorize it, the rich foods are meat, dairy, eggs, poultry, fish, and oil, then you can take action. People ask me often, how do I change? What do I do to change? Well, I have to defer to our former first lady, Nancy Reagan. Just say no. That's the only card on the table, I promise you. You just say, you have been addicts before some of you. Tobacco, alcohol, other addicts. Well, how did you fix it? You just stop, plain and simple. Unless somebody gives you these clear marks of distinction, you don't stand a chance. If they tell you moderation is okay, a little bit's okay. I don't understand a one cigarette or two cigarettes a day. I know two packs, I know none. That's why I teach the way I do, is I want you to be able to take action. As far as, uh, as, far as sugar, you know what I mean by sugar, plants make, Plants take carbon dioxide from the air and water from the ground and then through a process called photosynthesis with the energy of sunlight, they make sugar. That's the basic element of energy, sugar. And then they combine these glucoses together in long chains called starch. Starch. Well, does sugar cause diabetes? Sugar raises blood sugar a, a little bit. It's supposed to after you eat. And people with diabetes have very high blood sugars. But that's what it is. And the other thing I have to mention is diabetics are very sick people. They have more, more Alzheimer's, more heart disease, they're more obese, but it's because, not because of the high sugar, it's because the foods they eat make them fat and sick and also the blood sugar is raised. So it is true, diabetics have more disease. But does sugar cause diabetes? Should be the question on your mind. You ought to look at the scientific research to prove it one way or the other. Oh, Shirley Sweeney did some of the first experiments, 1927, we talked about them a little bit this weekend. Uh, Shirley Sweeney took his medical students, he divided into uh, several groups, he fed them either high sugar or high fat diets. All of his medical students became diabetic within about three days on a high fat diet, on a high sugar diet, no diabetes. But his mentor was a fellow by the name of Percival Hemsworth. Percival Hemsworth did the classic study published in 1940, uh, some of his final work in the British Medical Journal. He took a diabetic, several diabetics, and what he did is he fed them either a high fat diet or a high carbohydrate diet, and look at their blood sugar levels after those two kinds of diets. Fat paralyzes insulin, prevents it from working. That's what the research says. You take type one diabetics, you feed them more carbohydrate, more sugar, their uh, blood sugar levels come, type 1 diabetics, their blood sugar levels come down and they require less insulin. That's what the current research says. How about just plain white sugar? How about, how about uh, maltose and dextrins, which are uh, refined starches and even simple sugars? What happens when you take diabetics and you feed them these kinds, uh, type 2 diabetics, feed them these kinds of foods? Well, Brunzel at the University of Washington, he answered that and published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1971. He took type 2 diabetics and he increased their simple sugar, uh, dextrans and maltose. Uh, dextrans are long, longer chains of uh, sugars, but, and uh, pl you know, plain, simple sugar. And he fed them to type 2 diabetics. He doubled the sugar intake from, by feeding formulas. 
from 45% to 85% sugar. And what happened to these diabetics? They all got better. Not worse, they all got better. This is published by Brunzel in the New England Journal of Medicine. Their uh, blood sugar levels improved. Their oral glucose tolerance tests improved. Their insulin levels improved. Everything got better. How in the world do you expect a diabetic to get better when they don't have the truth? These data, they said, suggest that a high carbohydrate diet increased the sensitivity of peripheral tissues to insulin. In other words, they cured type 2 diabetes. The Pritikin program, one of my mentors, you go to my February 2013 newsletter, you'll find uh, the source of one of the men whose shoulders I stand on, Nathan Pritikin. He published data uh, many years ago. You know, one, two decades ago about his results on more than 10,000 patients where they put them on a diet similar to what we've eaten this weekend. And these type 2 diabetics were cured. They stopped their insulin. They were all diabetic pills. Same thing as we find. Type 2 diabetes, by the way, is 100% curable. 100% curable with dietary change. That's by definition, it's 100% curable. Now, I do have to explain to you, there's type 2 diabetes which is where the body naturally adapts to this excess nutrition. Type 2 diabetics make plenty of insulin, in fact, often twice as much as people without diabetes. Then there's type 1 where they, a diabetic doesn't make much insulin in the pancreas or none at all. And those people absolutely require insulin, type 1 diabetics do. Then there's something in between which a lot of people have, which is what we refer to as type 1 and a half diabetes. It's a relative insulin insufficiency. How do you know if you have that? Well, if you're overweight, you follow our diet, you get some exercise, you lose the weight. If your blood sugar is still up, then you're probably a type one and a half diabetic. I do treat even people who are called type two diabetics, I do treat them with insulin. If they lose too much weight, if they develop symptoms of diabetes, such as excess urination, or they worry about the numbers. Remember I told you the first evening that aggressive treatment of type 2 diabetes with insulin and diabetic pills in three, six studies, but three major studies published in 2008 in the New England Journal of Medicine show that aggressive treatment of diabetes kills. Kills. The National Heart and Lung Blood, uh, Blood Institute stopped the ACCORD study 17 months early because of an increased risk of death and heart disease. The advanced study, the veteran study. You want to stay out of the medical business. And the only way I know how to stay out of the medical business is to get healthy. The only way I know to get healthy is to fix the problem. The problem's the food. James Anderson, University of Kentucky, he published his results on type 2 diabetics. This was uh, before 1979. People on uh, 26 units of insulin a day uh, took patients, lean patients. These weren't even overweight patients. Put them on a high carbohydrate diet and he essentially took all of them off diabetic pills and uh, most of them off insulin. Do you feel cheated? Neil Bernard, who's going to be one of our guest speakers at the September 5 through 7, 2014 Advanced Study Weekend. He showed the same thing. You take uh, type 2 diabetics, you put them on a vegan, low-fat diet, they get off their medications, their blood sugars are better than people on the standard diabetic diet. You can find out more about this if you go to my January 2014 newsletter. I wrote an article which we just published at the beginning of this month called The Smoke and Mirrors Behind Wheat Belly and Grain Brain. You don't even have to try to trouble to look up the papers. Uh, they're all links there. All those papers I showed you, you just go blink, hit the link, and the paper shows up. No debate here, no effort here. It's all there for you to share with those of you who say, I'm confused. You know, they're telling me uh, that grains and wheat are causing obesity and diabetes. It doesn't seem right to me. I'm confused. I understand why you're confused. It wasn't by accident. Why do these uh, ideas get perpetuated? Well, people love to hear good news about their bad habits. And the meat, dairy, and fish industries, they don't object at all. All right, let's talk about some serious uh, diabetic uh, health therapy. I want to talk to you about one of my mentors. I stand on the shoulders of great men. 
As I know, some of you are going to stand on the shoulders of Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Campbell, some of the speakers that you heard today. The ultimate diet, you can find this, you can read the paper, I encourage you to do it, uh, many papers. Uh, it was uh, by one of my mentors, uh, one of the most important men in my life, Dr. Walter Kempner. Uh, Dr. Kempner came from Germany. He was, uh, he was involved in the Nazi occupation of Germany. Came to uh, the United States in 1934. Uh, he started the rice diet in 1939 at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. The rice diet was the major contributor to the success of Duke University financially for over two decades. Dr. Walter Kempner. I want to tell you, uh, I didn't, never got a chance to meet Dr. Kempner. Uh, it's one of my regrets in life, but he would never even let his photograph be taken or an interview be done of him. He went uh, to several medical meetings, Dr. Kempner did, and one medical meeting he went to, to in New York to talk to doctors invited by the American Medical Association. Somebody got up, and maybe it was just a joke, and accused him of switching the slides of the before and after patients. He said, I'll never do it again. I'll never talk to him again. Dr. Kempter was asked to do randomized control trials of his patients. He said, that's unethical. I know the rice diet works. It would be unethical to subject people to the disease-producing diet. It would be unethical. He wouldn't do it. Uh, some of the results of the Kempter diet, which you can expect. The Kempter diet, by the way, is uh, just to get to it, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute is a diet, you think we're, you're, we're severe here? The Kempter diet is white rice, he used to wa wash the rice. Why did he use white rice? Because he thought it was more palatable and more available. Why did he wash it? Because he wanted to get all the sodium out. Uh, why did he add table sugar, white sugar to his diet? He said because, because uh, even rice was too burdensome for these very sick people in terms of excess protein and other nutrients. So what Dr. Kempner would do is feed him a diet of rice, fruit, fruit juice, and sugar. And he would get these kinds of results. Morbid obesity reversed. Retinopathy. This is where he was accused of switching the slides. Retinop diabetic retinopathy is a disease where people go blind. Right now, they, they get laser treatment for it and uh, you know, a few drugs, et cetera. But they basically go blind because of vascular blood vessel disease that you can see if I look into your eyes. But understand, ladies and gentlemen, this blood vessel disease is going on throughout your body, not just in your eyes. It's in your kidneys, your legs. Every part of your body, this same disease is going on. And you see in the eye grounds, if your doctor just looks in the back of your eye with an ophthalmoscope, the doctor can see your blood vessels. And what you'll see on the left-hand frame is you'll see hemorrhages and exudates in diabetic retinopathy. And then Dr. Kempner put them on the rice diet, and you'll see reversal of diabetic retinopathy. 44 diabetics uh, studied. 22 of them showed this dramatic reversal. And one of his colleagues, Van Eck, showed the same thing in the same period of time. You will not find an ophthalmologist that I know of that will offer his or her patient this dramatic benefit from a simple dietary change. It's lasers, it's all kinds of other high-tech, high-profit things. And it's not necessarily the doctor's fault. This is just business, folks, just business. And uh, Retinal Physician, a magazine, they talked about this, how, what a shame it is that ophthalmologists don't learn this simple technique. But why would you? Tell me why in the world it would be taught or anybody would learn it. It's, it's the money. Uh, here's one of Dr. Kempner's patients, uh, a child, 13 years old female with a terrible nephrotic syndrome, failing kidneys. Put her on the rice diet. Reversal of kidney disease, dramatic improvement in health. Simply a dietary change. Uh, we've had uh, guests here, speakers who have been involved with Dr. Kempner, and one of the things they comment to me about is, you know, McDougall, you're just like Kempner. You take people off all their drugs. Well, sick people take drugs. I told you, it's fear-based medicine. Dr. Kempner wasn't afraid. Dr. Esselstyn's not afraid. Dr. Montgomery's not afraid. Dr. Campbell's not afraid. 
Other doctors aren't afraid. Uh, reversed uh, coronary insufficiency. When you have blocked coronary arteries, closed coronary arteries, you can see it on an EKG. Uh, there's something called the T wave, uh, which is uh, following the big spike. It becomes inverted and depressed. It's a sign of ischemia, low blood supply to the heart muscle. Well, everything I'm telling you was published before 1953. Dr. Kempner showed that simply by changing people to a diet that's more than 90% carbohydrate, white rice and sugar, you could dramatically reduce the cholesterols in people, 93% of them, dramatically reduce them. Reverse coronary artery disease as demonstrated by EKGs. Get people off of walking, get their arthritis to go away, get their chest pain to go away by this simple technique. Uh, heart failure. Here's an example, typical example, these are typical examples. This is not the best case scenario. This is what you should expect. Uh, people with failing hearts, their hearts sometimes would occupy the whole chest cavity on x-ray. Put them on the rice diet, their hearts shrunk down to normal size in half the cases. EKGs reverted to normal, as I showed you in the previous slide, in half the cases. High blood pressure, what you guys got is wimpy high blood pressure. I like Dr. Walter Kempner's patients. They had severe hypertension, malignant hypertension, malignant hypertension, deadly hypertension. There were no drugs back then to treat it, and so they would come to Durham, North Carolina, for the cure. People with blood pressures of 200, 230, 240, over 120, 140, 160, he would put them on the rice diet and cured 60% of the people. Yeah, well, now we have drugs that are of value. I use medications to treat high blood pressure. I'm a real doctor. I have a real prescription pad. I do prescribe medications. I do prescribe high blood pressure treatment, but I do it by the criterion I showed you on Friday night. Uh, when people deserve to be on blood pressure medication, when I believe the good will outweigh the harm, and those standards are changing, as I showed you by the Joint Committee's new recommendation that we don't treat high blood pressure in people over 60 unless it's 150 over 90 or greater. Remember, it used to be 140 over 90, and with people with diabetes, 130 over 80. Uh, people are starting to look at the science. Disappearance of psoriasis. <clears throat> I went to the uh, Kempter Clinic a few years back after Dr. Kempter died, and I talked to uh, Dr. Dillon and Dr. Rosati and we talked about the cure of our patients with uh, severe inflammatory arthritis, uh, psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, et cetera, with a simple dietary change. And they said to me, well, you know what Dr. Kempner would say is he'd say it's because it's low sodium and it takes the swelling out of the joints. Well, I say it's due to an autoimmune reaction due to the dairy and the animal proteins. Who cares? You know where the pump is, you can take the handle off. Composition of the rice diet. Ordinary American diet is, uh, this is the ordinary American diet back then, is uh, some carbohydrate, protein foods, animal foods, uh, some fat, maybe some extra fats. The rice diet is white rice. Why do they use white rice? Because it was more palatable and available. Brown rice works just fine. Uh, took the animal foods out of the person's diet. Very, very low fat diet like we're teaching you. Very low sodium. You know, lowering sodium in the diet doesn't make a lot of difference in blood pressure if you lower it, say, uh, 2,300 milligrams. Uh, it doesn't make it. It drops the top number by about uh, four millimeters of mercury and the bottom number by about a half a millimeter of mercury. It doesn't make a lot when you shift from a uh, high moderate sodium diet to a low moderate sodium diet. But if you really want to drop the blood pressure, you eat uh, the Kefir diet, which is about 50 grams of sodium, milligrams of sodium. You had to w w wash the rice to get the salt off. And of course, you know, you want to, uh, if you're that sick and under, want to go under that kind of diet, you want to have some serious medical attention, to say the least. But these are the kind of cures that are available for free, for free, no profit. <laughs> Dr. Rosati uh, has been here as a speaker to our advanced study weekend. 
If you go to my December 2013 newsletter, you'll see a segment from the Advanced Study Weekend by Dr. Rosati talking about the rice diet in Durham, North Carolina, which, by the way, closed last November, but is reopening. Dr. Rosati right here on this stage at the Advanced Study Weekend. How lucky we are. And uh, Francis Nealon, he was here about a year ago on this stage and talked to you about the rice diet, Dr. Walter Kempner. This is my December 2013 newsletter. You can see interviews by both of these men right here on stage at the Advanced Study Weekend. You can also read the biography of Dr. Kempner, which was published by one of his best friends, Dr. Newborg. She's a medical doctor and internist. She will likely not make it here because of her age. But she would tell you all about Dr. Kempner and all about these miracle cures by doing something very simple. If you want to learn more about Dr. Kempner, I encourage you to get the book. Uh, let's see, the McDougall diet. The McDougall diet is starches, vegetables, and fruits. We add a little uh, simple uh, sugar to the diet if you want a little uh, a little sugar on your oatmeal in the morning, maybe a little maple syrup on your pancakes. We put salt shakers on the table to add a little salt to the surface of the food. Why do I do that? <clears throat> because I want you to eat the food. That's why I do it. I want you to like the food. No apology. <clears throat> this man was the greatest influence in my entire medical career. He proved to me that uh, a simple diet worked, that there was no such thing as nutritional deficiencies on a plant food based diet. Remember, remember, his diet was a diet of white rice, and uh, that's about 5% protein. To cut the protein down, he had to add table sugar to cut the protein in half. And his contemporaries at that time, they tested his diet. They took patients, eight of his patients, for example, put them in a metabolic ward to try and prove Dr. Kempner was wrong, and these people would become nutritionally deficient. They couldn't do it. There was no protein deficiency, half the diet sugar, half the diet white rice. They did add vitamin pills. It was white rice. You can live on a diet of potatoes and water. Uh, that gives you everything you need except B12, sweet potatoes and water. If you eat just rice or legumes, grains or legumes, you have to add a source of vitamin A or C, like maybe a slice of orange a day or a floweret of broccoli to give you the A and C. But that just shows you how nutritionally complete plant foods are. I mean, think about it. Think about what people have lived throughout history on what kinds of diets. When the, uh, the provider left the home, he or she looked at the homemaker. They didn't have a conversation like, you know, I hope you get enough, uh, enough meat so we can have all our essential amino acids or vitamins or minerals from our plants. It, I just hope you get enough food to feed the children, is what they said. But I have to say this whole hunter-gatherer thing goes back to sexism. Who did the gathering? Grandparents, the women, the children. Who did the hunting? Yeah. The guys get the glory, right? Okay. I stand on Dr. Kempner's shoulders. Before I was born, May 17, 1947, Dr. Kempner had to disproven concepts that your doctors still hold today as true. They think diet has little to do with heart disease. That's what many of your doctors think, not your educated ones. Please don't take this personal. Additional protein improves health. Before I was born, Dr. Kempner knew that was untrue. And he knew that carbohydrates did not cause diabetes. His diabetics were cured on a diet of sugar. Do I ever use the Kempner diet? Yeah, I do for some of you. you now, some of my patients who come to see me, they have profound kidney failure, profound heart failure. I put them on the Kempner diet, I do. That's what really works. White rice, fruits, fruit juices, simple sugar. Later on, they get some vegetables maybe, maybe some, some animal food. Later, Dr. Kempner would give them. The difference in the diets is the McDougal diet is for the living. The Kempner diet is for the nearly dead. But aren't you glad we have that option to avoid a lifetime of drugs, heart surgery, et cetera? I thank Dr. Kempner. I thank all of the men whose shoulders I stand on. If 
you want to read more about Dr. Kempner and his work, it's in the December 2013 McDougal Newsletter free online. Thank you very much. I have, uh, I guess, you know, I just don't know. You know, I, I give brand new talks every time that I speak at an advanced study weekend. Sometimes I don't know how long they're going to last. Uh, this is the first time I've given this talk, the first time I give the one on Friday night. Uh, when you go to a concert, you like to hear the old songs, the ones you're familiar with. Well, those, those songs are uh, free on my website. Basically, everything's free. People ask, why do you give everything away free? Well, at one time, we couldn't sell it. So we had to give it away free. Uh, now it is a profound obligation that Mary and I and Heather, my son, my family, my brother, Dr. William McDougal. Are you still here? Stand up, Bill. My brother, Dr. William McDougal, a board certified internist. <laughs> it's uh, with profound gratitude that we've had the opportunity to learn this not just for our own family, but to be real doctors. Uh, as I explained to the California Medical Board, is that doctors are being cheated of the opportunity to be real healers because doctors know nothing about the cause of disease. And I don't exaggerate. Your physicians are being cheated, dietitians are being cheated, natural healers are being cheated. We're the luckiest doctors in the world. So we give back to you as much as we can. I hope every one of you, you're thinking, you know, this is more than I ever thought I would get at this advanced study weekend. I know I sacrificed time and money to be here, but I got more than I ever expected. That's what we try to accomplish. And with everything we do, we try and accomplish that. I hope we've succeeded. Yes. Thank you. Dr. McDougall, I'm KT Cook from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and first I want to thank you for speaking and teaching the truth. Because of what you teach, I have hope for a healthy and trim future. Secondly, I'd like to ask you a question. You've discussed the reversal of diabetes with diet, and Dr. Esselstyn discussed the reversal of heart disease with diet. Have you ever seen a starch-based diet reverse, not just arrest, but reversed dementia? Uh, dementia has many causes. Could be little strokes, those are scars, that's too late. I remember I told you I had a massive stroke at 18. That's why I walk so funny, is because of the massive stroke I had at 18. Bill remembers he was just a, a young boy. A dead disaster in my family, but what a huge opportunity. If I wouldn't have had that massive stroke at 18, I wouldn't be here right now. You know, I, I learned, you know, you learn from those opportunities. I used to think as my brother, William, Bill, who I know him as, we used to think doctors were next to God, and then we met God. We met doctors. And, uh, you know, it's, we're just people. We're all just people. Uh, so if you have a stroke, it's not reversible. That happened to me when I was 18 years old. You know, that's almost 50 years ago. I still windsurf. I still ski, but it's not a pretty sight. <laughs> uh, as far as other causes, Alzheimer's, I believe, is due to lum aluminum poisoning. Uh, Parkinson's, I believe, is due to organophosphate pesticide poisoning. These are permanent, uh, permanent conditions. The brain does not regrow. You want to prevent these things. You walked into this room, all of you did. You just want to be able to walk out and in again. You just want to stop the injury, stop the repeated injury. It is your fork and spoon. It's the closest contact with, you, with your environment. That's as encouraging I can be, and I hope that's encouraging enough. It's amazing what the body does if you give it half a chance. We are living with a family member that's in the throes of dementia, and as far as yeah. we know, she's not ever had a stroke, but she doesn't even know her own husband. I understand. Uh, Nathan Pritikin talked about people who were severely mentally compromised who woke up on a healthy diet. Those are testimonies that are miracles and beyond expectation, but there are some reasonable things you can expect. <clears throat> I have not exaggerated. Dr. Esselstyn did not exaggerate. Dr. Montgomery did not exaggerate. Yes? Um, I was wondering uh, what, what your comment was on high fructose corn syrup and how it compares to regular table sugar metabolically. Because I've read some studies on just, I mean, it, it 
seems well, to really cause a lot of weight gain, and I was just wondering if there yeah, was any fructose. Yeah, I, I can address fructose. I didn't understand what your second comment was. Fructose is a uh, sugar naturally found in fruit. Uh, it is um, concentrated in high fructose corn syrup. It is similar to table sugar. Uh, uh, of all the sugars, fructose has, uh, all the foods I can think of, of, fructose has the lowest glycemic index. It's about 20 compared to white bread or white sugar. But it raises cholesterol and triglycerides more than any other sugar I know. Concentrated fructose does. People say it's obesogenic. I don't know. I don't know if it is or not. Uh, you shouldn't be eating uh, simple sugar except for a little flavoring in most cases. Uh, I hope I've gotten that point across clearly. It is a flavoring to uh, make the diet so appealing. Nobody, nobody could uh, turn it down. I eat my oatmeal plain. Mary eats hers with a little brown sugar on the She's bad. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. McDougall. I, I agree with everything you said. I did have two questions, though, about the wheat and the produce, the idea that, you know, a piece of broccoli. The idea with the wheat is that the hybridization of wheat over the last couple of decades, they've done to gluten what they've done to chicken breasts, made, made the... That, that there's more gluten in a piece of bread, that maybe that's part of it. And then the idea that our produce today is uh, so much less nutritionally dense because of being picked before ripeness and transported. And what are your thoughts and comments uh, about that? You know, I really have not much to say about the hybridization of wheat and the modifications we've made. We're in Santa Rosa. You heard of Luther Burbank? They've been doing that for a long time. Uh, I, don't, I don't really want to address that. I just tell you that's... Uh, that's taking you off track of the problem. Plain and simple, people would be better off on any kind of wheat, even uh, white bread wheat, than they would on animal flesh and uh, mammal uh, uh, secretions. Okay, uh, your second question was <coughs> about the produce. And I know a lot of you are concerned about getting enough nutrients. So you wanna worry about the nutritional quality of your fruits and vegetables, whether it's organically raised, whether it's too cooked or so on. Uh, have you uh, folks experienced a, any nutritional deficiencies in your friends and relatives like scurvy, beriberi, pellagra, protein deficiency, essential fat deficiency? Uh, we're looking over here at the problem in terms of deficiency, and we're trying to solve it with uh, solutions that aren't going to work, including vitamin pills, which I told you clearly are a waste of money and toxic. If you turn your vision 180 degrees and look over here in terms of excess, have you met any people with problems of excess? Excess calories, excess fat, excess cholesterol, excess salt, excess protein. You're not going to solve problems of excess by treating nutritional deficiencies. I hope that's adequate. That, that's, you, you know, don't get lost in the woods. The, the answer is so stupid, simple. All of you should be sitting here and asking why if it's so stupid simple and so inexpensive and solves so many problems as you've learned this week. This is not the solution to one problem. And I do want to emphasize this is this starch solution. And until you understand you are a starch eater, a starchitarian, a starch of war, you're, you're lost. You're trying to eat nutrient-dense foods, broccoli, cauliflower, et cetera, you starve. You uh, try and make up for the calorie deficiencies because you're not eating rice, corn, potatoes, and beans. and uh, and. Uh, uh, you focus on these uh, nutritarian, high-density nutrient foods, and you're starving. What do you reach for? The nuts and seeds and avocados, and now you're fat. You just don't understand. Why doesn't it work? Is there something wrong with the human body? Was the human body designed incorrectly? 400 million years of evolution or divine creation? Is it wrong? Ladies and gentlemen, we can agree on one thing. It is not wrong. Yes. Uh, in my experience uh, helping people uh, change their diet, I've, I've run into a little bit of a roadblock twice now. Um, hyperthyroidism, and I, these people have their doctors telling them to avoid um, uh, potatoes and starchy vegetables, and, and I'm not really sure. I wouldn't know why. Hyperthyroidism, I wouldn't know why. I don't really even know the cause. Maybe it's due to some environmental poison would be my best guess. Hypothyroidism, hypo, is an autoimmune disease. I understand what you said. I don't know. Hypo is an autoimmune disease. It's called Hashimoto's thyroiditis or autoimmune thyroiditis. And I, I, there's a whole other lecture I gave you on that. 
on what causes it, and it has to be treated by supplementing with thyroid. Yes. Dr. Madugo, I have a niece that's got uh, Lyme's disease, and it's a pretty sad situation. Yes. And uh, it's, what I can gather, it doesn't seem to be recognized by the medical profession. Oh, that's See, not true. It's, it's a spirochete infection. It's an infection, uh, and it makes all the sense in the world that no matter what's wrong with you, that you eat well. Whether you have a spirochete infection or, uh, you know, you lost a leg or... Uh, whatever's wrong with you, you, you need to have the fundamentals of good nutrition. <clears throat> I really can't address Lyme disease with you right now, but just uh, understand that your, uh, your relative should be eating well and needs other care. And if you email me, by the way, I still am excited and, and able to answer all of my emails. If you email me, I'll try and give you a short personal answer to your questions. Yes. Uh, Dr. McDougall, you answered my question as I stood in line, but I'm going to ask you again anyway. Uh, this is in regards to neurological brain diseases, specifically Parkinson's. Yeah. Um, can those people have the most success on the McDougall diet, and will this stop at least the progression of their disease? Uh, I believe extent? Parkinson's is due to pesticide organophosphate mm -hmm. poisoning. As you move up the food chain, you know, there's the argument for eating natural organic foods. You understand that. But where you get your pesticide load as you move up the food chain, from the grasses and grains to the animals, <coughs> up the, the fish chain from the fish who eat the plant foods to the big fish who eat the little fish, et cetera, eat low on the food chain to minimize your intake of organic phosphates and other environmental chemicals. Uh, Parkinson's disease is a permanent damage to the substantia nigra of the brain. It is not going to be reversed. Will this diet, will your diet at least help to arrest the disease? You would think if you stop the injury, you stop the repeated injury, you'll slow or stop the progression and maybe reverse the disease. Um, Dr. McDougall, I use stevia for sweetening, stevia extract, right. and just wanted to find out what you think of it. Uh, stevia is a uh, sweetener, which is from plants. Uh, we don't use it anymore. <clears throat> and yeah. why is that? Well, I, you know, I, I really don't want to get into okay. the, the, science, the details on it. But as I say, it's not a uh, teaspoon of simple sugar in your cereal that's killing you. Yeah, uh, 20 teaspoons in uh, several Coca-Colas or sodas a day is killing you, making you fat and sick. I'm sure you understand the difference, and I greatly appreciate your attention. And now you're going to hear uh, the uh, smartest, best psychologist in the world after our 10-minute break. Thank you very much. Thank you.